There's just something about growing a garden that tends to bring out the truth of a lot of what the scriptures teach. Part of the reason why we're so disassociated is because we don't connect as much as we used to with that aspect of life that is all around us, that maybe we take for granted, but have kind of gotten distant from. And a lot of times people get carried away maybe by becoming greenies or you know, save the planet, save the earth kind of person, but that's really not what God did when he gave over his charge to Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, you know, subdue the earth and you know, take care of it as a garden. Really what he was doing was giving Adam an opportunity to participate with God's direction, causing a understanding of why, who, and how God created the world. Because you see, in the beginning it says that God created the heavens and the earth, and it talks about how he did it, and he says, at the end of each day that he did it, he said, it was good. So you can take from that an aspect of reality when you look at creation that, though it's under a curse, there's something about it that was good. There's something about it that is good for us. When you take a look at what we have done, a lot of times in our modern technology, I'd like to say that 90% of what we do is good. Okay, I'd like to say 10% of what we do is good. But part of my problem is, you see, I've lived about 35 years. Okay, maybe I've lived 55 years. But at 35 years plus as a Christian, I've seen what man has done in making things. We tend to not worry about the consequences when we want to make something now and worry about it later. You know what I mean. We take chemicals and we mix them up, you know, and we use them as we choose to. And then sometimes down the road we find out, oops, we should have been protecting our flesh from asbestos. We should have been taking care of these toxic chemicals because now they affect us. We have reduced our lifestyle to a pattern of let's go ahead and make it easier on us now and we'll pay the piper later. That's really not what God intended. You see, the body itself that we live in, this temple of flesh, even though it's wearing down, and it's kind of like getting older, in case you hadn't noticed, you're getting older. It's also being corrupted, is that it originally was intended to heal itself, to take care of itself. Even stem cells, we're finding out, rejuvenate parts of the body we never thought would have been healed or repaired before. God made the body in a certain way to really live forever, eternally. But when the curse came upon us because of Adam's sin, we discovered that that curse was corruption, that we saw a physical aspect of the law of physics come into play, which is that everything wears down. And from that moment, that law went into play. We began to die, as it were, from the moment we were born, because we began to become corrupted from what God's image of what he created in the beginning to what we now are become, which is an imagined idea of what God actually intended. You see, that's part of the problem with where we're at today. We look at the end of this age and we say, look at what man has done, and we elevate ourselves as though we were gods to think that this is something wonderful when God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways, that we probably have gone the wrong way in technology where God may be saying the right way to do things in his way. You see, it's not a matter of being green and it's not a matter of using technology in some positive way, but it's going back to what Jesus said in a simple way. You know, very simply put, you reap what you sow.
the reverend preacher that was famous for being kind of thought of as a wacko said something that J. Vernon McGee, who's not a wacko, said the very same expression, chickens come home to roost. It's an old Southern Baptist expression or Southern Pentecostal expression that talks about you reap what you sow. Well, when we make things, we don't take into account where they come from, what it costs, what the long-term effects will be, and how it will affect future generations or affect even ourselves by what we're doing. I know when I look at our modern society and all the things we have to do in order to keep up our modern society, the question becomes, are we really getting more time and enjoying it and producing more? Or are we actually doing less and producing less and becoming enslaved to our own technocracy? That's something that you yourself could study on your own. You can learn and discover whether you agree or not because there's a lot of benefits people enjoy in technology. You're looking at one of them. Cameras and videos and being able to reach out and to speak to someone. But you know, how many neighbors do you know today? How many people do you actually relate to in a personal way? There was a time when in farming communities and in tight-knit communities that depended upon each other, they, quite frankly, depended upon each other. You knew who your butcher was because you trusted your butcher because you knew him, you knew where he lived. You could go find out whether he's got good meat or bad meat. You knew who the baker was because, quite frankly, you knew how he operated his business so you could get quality bread from your local baker. You knew who you were buying from. You knew what you were getting. Sadly today, we are so disassociated with what God intended and when the kingdom come, will you be more attuned to the world and its ways or instructed in what God would have for you to be and to say? Because God is personal. God is real. God wants you to know him in such an intimate way that even though you live in a technology world with technocracy all around you, he is able to communicate to you in ways you never dreamed of or thought of because he already knew the beginning from the end. And when finally this great tribulation comes, so to speak, some things that will be accomplished will be amazing to you that might surprise you. Like wiping man's image off the face of the earth. Because the things that we've created really are for our own benefit and have nothing to do with God. God will eventually wipe out <laughs> technology and bring to its conclusion the idea that man can rule himself when the fact is we can't even rule our own households as we've proven to ourselves in this last generations. We see children rebellious and adding with attitudes actions that we never would have dreamed of when we were growing up and how fast exponentially this has happened because it wasn't always about just technology and man doing his own thing but it was also about a spiritual rebellion going on in heavens. There was this kind of thing happening that God had determined that judgment would come upon this rebellion that happened among angelic beings. The same way that God had determined that judgment would come to our lives if we rebelled against what God had said. That rebellion is what caused sin to enter into the world. It's what caused corruption to come into our lives. It's what caused us to not live forever, literally. So because of this corruption, there has to be a solution to corruption. This corruption must put on incorruption in order for it to live eternally. In order for you to go beyond this measure of life that you call life and death, you must experience something beyond that, which some people would describe as being born of the Spirit. Because whether you recognized it or not, there is a tripart aspect to life. A body, a soul, and a spirit. And quite simply, if you are a spiritual being and you have a soul, then that soul is going to return to the one that made it. The one that breathed life into this flesh and blood that you see before you. 
and caused you to become a living being. And that's where a lot of people kind of, they like to think that they're the masters of creation by injecting sperm into an ovum and thinking they've made life. No. Without there being God involved, the natural aspect doesn't take place because that's why there's so many that don't conceive. Because conception is always a tripart aspect. Whenever you look at everything in reality of threes, the book of Romans says something interesting. It says, it says, even the nature of God, even the fact that he's Father, Son, and Spirit, the very Godhead himself is revealed in nature. That's interesting to me because I'm so far removed from creation or agrarian society, meaning that agrarian just simply means the farm type idea of having cattle or having sheep or having farms or communicating your vocation by doing it in some way that was simple by direct association with created things that God had done in what we call agrarian, meaning farming community or less than industrialization. I'm so far removed from that, I can't look at creation and say to myself honestly before your eyes right now that I see the Godhead in plants. I don't. Do you? I mean, if I add my imagination, if I try to create some way of demonstrating the Godhead to you, maybe I could come up with something, you know, like stem and root and leaf, but then my mind just kind of wanders and says, that's really not God revealing himself as a Godhead in creation, is it? So for me, I don't see it quite as simply as to put it bluntly, third world countries do. You see, the interesting thing is if you've ever been a missionary overseas, you find, quite frankly, some miraculous things happening in countries that sometimes we play down so much so that we don't really understand the fact that God does move just like he did in the Old Testament and just like he does in the New Testament and does perform miracles. The only reason I say this is because I know I saw a man get up and walk that had bones for legs and the next day he had meat on the bones. That's impossible. That's not possible in any physical realization that you want to describe it. And for me, I was the big, biggest cynic because when I went on that missionary outreach, I was the one who said, no, I don't do healings. I don't lay hands on people. I don't see them, you know, kind of, you know, do whatever God wants them to do. And because I was an a interpreter at the time, my partner that was with me at the time was all excited about wanting to, oh, do this, that, and the other thing, you know, to get this poor man who was laying in a hovel, you know, to stand up and walk, you know. And I was like, uh-uh. And I was one hand in my mind telling God, no way, Jose, you know, I'm out of here. You know, and if this dude tries to make me do it, I'm going to embarrass the snot out of him by checking out and walking away because without an interpreter, he won't be able to do what he wants to do. Well, I didn't. I kept interpreting. And sure enough, we picked up the guy and he fell flat on his face, which is about what I expected, which was, you know, typical for my attitude in those days because I was very much mad at God about lots of things that I didn't understand. You know, things that I read in scripture that said God could speak and he hadn't, or God could do this and he didn't, and God would do something and I didn't understand why. Of course, <laughs> little did I know that that was the beginning of my journey and that the next day as I was standing in front of the entire little church, that we, were, we had built, you know, the walls foundation, the rock foundations were there, and we had built just the frame work. We were building the outer frame for a church, and just the walls were up, and so we were holding each night, you know, a little meeting, you know, with, you know, kind of torches, and, you know, well, not torches, but anyways, little oil lamps, and so the oil lamps were there, and the pastor was talking, and I was interpreting for him, you know, and I had to stand up there and do it, and, you know, I was kind of like, usually enjoy being behind the scenes, but this time I was kind of out front. You know, so when this man and his family came walking down the center aisle, my face went white. 
I kept interpreting what the pastor was saying, but my face was white as a ghost. My eyes were big brown, and my tongue would have dropped to the floor because the man that I had dropped flat on his face the day before was walking in the church that night, not that night, but the next day at night. And so when he walked down and went to the front pew, I could see his legs because he was wearing shorts because it was a hot climate. And there was meat on his bones. Well, needless to say, that night I went up to the hill that was above the little church and all alone cried and kind of talked to God about it and apologized for being so mad at him about him, you know, thinking that, you know, or me thinking that I knew what was going on and that somehow my faith was required for healing or that somehow God couldn't do what he wants to do anytime he wants to do it. And maybe he wanted to do it just to teach me a lesson. And I remembered one of Chuck Smith's teaching tapes on that. And sure enough, it had nothing to do with my faith. And it had nothing to do with anybody else's. It had everything to do with what God chose to do. And that's kind of what happens in life. You see, you go along in your life and everything's fine and hunky-dory. You wake up in the morning, you know, and you see things and they all make sense. You get a job, you get a vocation, you get a wife, you get kids, you get the car, you get all these things going along, just smooth sailing. Then all of a sudden something upsets the apple cart. And you have to change your way of thinking. And it doesn't make sense to you. It's like, I thought I knew it all. Now, I'm not so sure. And that's when God begins to intervene in your life. God sometimes will shake up your apple cart to change your way of thinking. Because beyond what you can see, touch, and feel, there's a whole universe that you haven't even begun to understand. Quantum physics has even designed a module that describes the aspects of the dimensionality of spiritual. Now that's amazing to me. Here we have mathematics and physics combined into quantum theories describing the spiritual aspect of not just heaven, but a spiritual dimension. Wow, doesn't that sound like the Bible? (laughs) And imagine that coming from sciences of all things. Huh. And yet they say that's not the only dimension there is. You see, we have dimensions all about us, whether you know it or not. You know, you see it on TV nowadays. Go see the latest 3D movie. And before there was like 2D. So those are two dimensions. There are three dimensions when you talk about... uh, Now we're going to get me into trouble for a minute. Um, Height, depth, width, and space, I believe. So once it's existing in height, width, and depth, you have three dimensions. Once you go beyond that, you have four dimensions. Now, I believe it's, I'm not positive, but it may be that time is the fourth dimension or the fifth, and that there's other dimensions also that have been described that I, at one time, kind of had my notes, (laughs) I used to just, I used to talk about them, you know, and I think there's like seven dimensions or something, or maybe more than that. But anyways, a rabbi back in, oh, I don't know, I guess it was like 1600s or somewhere farther back before, you know, quantum physics and before modern math and before all these ideas came out and all this kind of like, you know, concepts described the dimensions that he learned from reading only the book of Genesis. That blows my mind. Quantum physics proves his theories, which is amazing because for him it wasn't a theory, it was a spiritual truth. But he learned it from reading Genesis. That's kind of weird. That means that he knew what we could know if we were possibly identified a little closer with what God had created the world to be with how God has designed the universe, with how God has made things as they are, and we have hidden them underneath this veneer of technology we think we understand so well. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe there's more to life than what you think. Maybe there's more to life than what you can see. Maybe there's more to life than what you know. And maybe there's more to this religion Christianity than you ever thought of. The tree of life. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 
He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. As the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Happy is the man that finds wisdom. Length of days is in her right hand. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom. Now as I freeze, the reason is because I have a hummingbird that's just now <laughs> flying pretty close. It came over the camera angle. I was trying to get to my hummingbird feeder right above. And the beauty of it is, is that that's why we called this Hummingbird Productions was that. <laughs> it seems that all my life in different aspects of how God uses his spirit to inspire me whether through studying the Word of God or hearing His voice or being convicted of sin or being challenged by the world and its ways or understanding discernment or wisdom or knowledge or all the different gifts and aspects and fruits of the Spirit that we know that the Bible talks to us. God sometimes uses animals in interesting ways you know, to inspire us, to turn our attention, to intervene, so to speak, at the right moment and the right time to change our direction to make us refocus, to look at something a little differently. Kind of like what we were describing earlier about how God intervenes in life and it changes your way of looking at everything. That moment of everything coming together in understanding is called gestalt. A gestalt experience is kind of what Paul had when he was knocked off his horse and he was thinking he was serving God until God spoke to him. And the amazing thing is, is that God spoke to him. Now, that's kind of where people are at today. They don't want to admit that God can speak because they're afraid that people are going to go off on some mental health kick and somehow Christians saying that they hear from God are like wacky khakis, you know, and they're like out there weirdos, you know, being bizarro and acting stupid and doing dumb things. Well, in the Old Testament, I'd agree. tried to sacrifice his son today, he'd be locked up. <laughs> That's for sure. If Jesus said that you know he was one with the Father, they'd crucify him today just like they did back then. Quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. The Bible is full of things that if you treated it in modern society, it'd be a little weird. But you see, that's why the Word of God, as Jesus is called, is not of this world. It's not of this world ways, and it's not of this world system. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like what Jesus said the kingdom would be all about, the Word of God. It is a way of walking and talking and knowing that there is a living God. It is choosing to listen carefully and hearing God's voice. Of not hearing some voice in your head, not walking as though you were dead in sin, and ignoring all the signs and wonders around you and just pretending like life goes on as though it were going to never end, which obviously it's going to, but it's rather recognizing the reality of spirituality that life is meant to be a part of. You are meant to be a complete person, body, soul, and spirit. And the way God designed you was to have that relationship with Him, to be complete in your body, in your soul, and in your spirit. And the only way that you could ever become spiritual or of the spirit would be to be born again, as Jesus said. Because Jesus made it very clear, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And if you don't, and if you aren't born of the spirit, then you must be born again. And even Nicodemus was smart enough to say, well, I don't get it. <laughs> it says, 
You want me to get in my mother's womb? Or what do you want me to do here? I don't get this spiritual part. And that's because Nicodemus had rejected the spirituality of Judaism at the time. He had gotten into only things which he could see, the things he could feel, the things he could hear, and the things he could touch. He had no concept of the reality of the living God being real in a person, much less inside of the fact that God was standing before him. Now, had he been taught? Yes. Judaism is very clear about its messianic principles. That's where we get the whole idea of Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's where we all know that Jesus is in us. It's because of Jewish thought, to put it bluntly, Jewish teaching, Jewish scriptures. They knew, but they had changed it over time because it didn't happen the way they thought. Things weren't going the way that they had thought God would do it. So they started adding things to make it fit for their everyday life. And sometimes that happens in your life. You change who God is to fit your idea of who you think he is. Then let him reveal himself to you. Because we're given the word of God and we're given Jesus for one specific reason. To reveal who God is. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Jesus said, I'm explaining to you things you don't understand. And I'm not even explaining the things of heaven. I'm explaining the things on earth that are basic principles. Even John, whom God sent, explained basics and you don't understand it. So if we were to explain heavenly things, how much less you would understand them also. And so there's a great misunderstanding all of us sometimes have of God. That's why we were told in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not into our own understanding in all our ways acknowledging him and let him direct our path because his direction in our life is one of constantly revealing himself to us day by day. He wants to keep adding a little more to your understanding of himself. He wants to gradually reveal completely who he is as the living God, as your creator, as the God who is called our Father. As the one Jesus said loves us so much that he is so tender that the only description for him that would fit would be called love. A patient love, a kind love, a gentle love, a love that is not provoked, a love that endures forever. That we don't understand, that we don't comprehend. We try to make excuses for how we apply it, but we have no realization of how God does it. And so, gradually, as you learn to accept the fact that you don't know it all, and as you begin to accept the fact that you are or need to be born again, God begins to speak to you in circumstances. And those circumstances start you on a journey that kind of begins to narrow the field of your focus. Those circumstances begin to bring you into a, a narrowing of all the things you're involved in. They begin to force you into dealing with some things that you may not want to deal with. Sin being one of them. Religion being another. Deciding to choose what you want to believe in. And you may choose to be a Muslim, you may choose to be a Mormon, you may choose to be a Jehovah's Witness, whatever. That may not be an accurate path. And the only way you'll be able to determine that is by dealing with God one to one. Because the frank reality of death is always on the horizon for you. You will die, and one day you will deal with the living God. Because whether you live or die, your soul will return to God who created it. And when you stand before the living God, according to Romans, he says, I have revealed myself to you. You will already have known that you made your choice, and you won't argue your case. You won't decide whether you knew that Jesus was the Son of God. You'll admit you failed, and you will bow a knee and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, because you'll already know. You will have already known, and in some way, you already know right now. Whether you choose to obey what God tells you today, or whether you choose to disobey what God tells you to do right now, that's your choice. You have freedom to do that, but that freedom comes with consequence. And that means that if you obey, you're obedient, 
But if you disobey, that means you're rebellious. And there's only one place for rebellion and corruption. And Satan himself rebelled up to a point where God even cast him away. And your point will become, at some point in time, though you are saved by grace, and it's a free gift that's been given to you because of what Jesus has done, though salvation has been made open to you, it's said that you should not perish, but have everlasting life. You could perish if you choose to reject everlasting life. And Jesus said, this is life everlasting, that they should know me and he who sent me, my Father. So if eternal life is knowing Jesus, then we are called and chosen and directed to know Jesus today. That's why we're so expressive of needing to seek him one-on-one -on -one alone and resolving for yourself what is this question you have about life is there more to life than just eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die are you really satisfied with your direction you're going is the object of your religious life and you have one one way or another whether it be football or whether it be baseball or whether it be sports or politics or you know work itself, you know, building your mega mini enterprise, you know, to be some kind of motivational speaker or whatever it may be. But when you reach your pinnacle of accomplishment and you look around and you see and feel like there should be more, you already know in your heart of hearts there is. Because God has said so. And you knew that. So whenever you decide to choose to learn more, Remember this, when you die, you will face Jesus. According to what we read, life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life, but he who has not the Son of God has not life. Your choice before you die has to be determined by you. Will you have the Son and have life, or will you have not the Son? and be eternally banished to a lake of fire where only Satan was designed to go. Because corruption must be placed outside of incorruption. And there's only one place for that, in heaven and earth, and in the new creation that's coming. And that is in a lake of fire that contains itself and burns itself and keeps everything else removed from that corruption so that there will be no corruption in the new heaven and the new earth. Have you heard God speak? Have you examined your heart? Have you sat down and looked at your life and said, maybe I've been directing it a little my way and it's not quite what I thought it would be and I've just been putting up with it for a long time now. I've just been dealing with it because after all, that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I live my life every single day, a moment of my life, by the Word of God spoken to me, by Jesus Himself telling me and directing me every single day of my life, this is what I want you to do. This is where you sin today. This is what you need to confess. This is what you blew it today. This is how you live today. This is where we need to develop you more and grow and become more like me. And every single day of my life, I am very much so convicted of my own sin because I am a sinner saved by grace but believe me I still sin every day even but that also gives me the motivation and the realization that yes by grace I'm saved and yes I hear his voice and I can't deny it I'd love to say that God doesn't talk I'd love to say that God doesn't speak I'd be a liar and have to stand before God and just say uh, well yeah I lied to those people Lord you know I told him you didn't speak well he does and lots of people, not just me, hear his voice, as he said and promised. He not only said it, he did it, and he's proving it to everyone in these latter days, as you live your life. But don't be distracted by going off into the world only and not taking Jesus with you. Because Jesus will cause you to be born again of the Spirit. 
but he'll cause you also in your newness of life to look at what you're doing when he's directing it differently than what you've done in the past. You may become a witness in your job as opposed to a witness of your job. And that's where the difference lies with most people. When they say they're a Christian and they're religious, they relegate it to their Christian religion called Christianity. But when they're a Christian in their job, in their vocation, in their life, everything they do is influenced by the Spirit of God in them, telling them, instructing them, and convicting them to do what he said or to repent for not doing what he said. What do you want to do? Do you want to live your life the way you choose and do it my way? I did it my way, as Frank Sinatra said. And really, he was not a happy man. <laughs> or do you want to do it another way? I can only tell you one thing to do. Find out. Prove it. God said it. Prove me now herewith. Prove me. You check it out. You look at the circumstances of God in your life and let him direct some of those until you finally hear his voice. But don't be satisfied with just living a life that you have to keep putting faith in something and just believe until somehow you know you got good feelings. No. I say get down on your knees and argue with God and fight for your faith and fight for the reality of knowing God in a personal and intimate way. Knowing that he's talking to you, knowing that he's real. Because until you do, I don't say go to church, I don't say pray, I don't say do all these spiritual things. I say get the reality of God first and discover if there is a God. Otherwise you're wasting your time and you're just playing at being who you're not. Find out today that God is real. Then go forward in Jesus and discover a life you never believed was going to begin and live throughout eternity.